Good morning to you here in Cascais, Portugal. And good evening or good morning to you who are in San Francisco, Chicago, elsewhere via Facebook. And uh, my name is Leza Nilovic. I'm from Nova School of Business Economics. Today, uh, together with Paul Wanderboer. Can I see the hand, Paul? Okay. I'll be the moderator, or we will be the moderator of this session. And um, Euro Bainat, Raid Ghani, Rodrigo Bello, Paul Wanderboer, and me, uh, supported by Nova School of Business and Economics, together and, uh, and the other sponsors, we'll come to that. Uh, we're the organizing committee of Data Science for Social Good Europe. And on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank you for joining us in celebrating Data Science for Social Good. I'll be having this phone. This is where my notes are. <laughs> I hope it's, uh, um, we'll start first with the welcoming part. Uh, in January 2016, I got an offer from NOVA to join uh, as a faculty. And uh, it was a spectacular welcome, because I see the dean in the corridor, and I say, I have an idea, and he tells me, come in, let's talk. And the meeting was about 10 minutes. I said, this is the SSG. He says, that is our focus and our strategic interest. Let's do it. Tell me what you need from me. And from then on, we're here together in Qashqais. And I would like to ask Daniel Trassa, uh, the dean of Nova School of Business and Economics, to join me here on the stage and to welcome this wonderful audience. Can I have a round of applause, applause for him? You want this or? It's okay. So first of all, thank you, Leid. Um, yeah, it happened exactly the way Leid described. He came into my office. The first thing I had to do is I had to actually get his last name right, which I'm sure you are struggling with. Uh, and he, um, he put this offer to me and we, we had run a strategic plan and there are two things that are very important to us, and I'll come back to this, thank you, in a second. There are two things that are very important to us, and when late came in, I said, these two things are important to us. The first thing, and I'll start with basic what's in there. Uh, it says data science for social good. Now, I'll break that in two. One is data science, the other thing is social good, and if you can move both of them together, it's even better, but I think these two things are very important for us. So I'll talk just very briefly, I have three minutes or less, uh, about each one of them. Data, uh, let's be very honest, the future is here. Uh, the future, I mean, data is within us, and if we have not woken up to it, and the impact that it will have for the good and for the bad in our lives, we are, we, 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 it's going to be too late. And so we need to wake up, and we are a school, Nova is a school that is very proud of actually thinking ahead and preparing our students for the future instead of preparing them for the past. And so for us, it's very important to, get, to change what we do, the way we do it, what we teach, uh, f to prepare them for the future. And so data science for social good actually was our, one of our first forays into the issue of data and dealing with data and doing better management of cities, of companies, of countries with data. And, and, and it's been a great experience and that will very soon permeate, we, um, we will be moving it into the core of our, of our, of our, of our course. I think it's gonna be here and we have found the funds to make them stay. And we're going to launch programs around it, and we're more and more going to start training our students and developing our students and building our students to be better able to handle data in the way they deal with problems and in the way they actually manage in the way they come up with solutions. And so this has been a critical element, and this is one of the reasons why data has been so important for us is because we believe that in the future, everything that we do will have data associated with it, and we're going to quickly focus a lot of what we do in our programs to actually increase the data content into it. The second element that came to it was social good, and sometimes the two of them don't work together. You know, there's all this talk about the future and whether the future is going to be interesting or not and whether the future is going to be good for everybody or not. And so social good is the second element that actually when Leid came and talked to me, uh, I thought it was very important because at the same time that we believe that we have to prepare our managers to manage for the future, with what will be the technologies of the future, with what will be the way of managing of the future, we believe that we have to prepare them to actually build a society that is sustainable from the point of view of the people, from the point of view of the environment, from the point of view of, uh, of, 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 the, of, of the general income dis distributional issues. And so, we, we, on the last time I was here, I 
it was for the Congress of the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship, an initiative also promoted by the municipality of Qashqai. At that time, I said, the reason why we as a school are committed to social entrepreneurship, to social innovation, is because we believe that in the future, the only way for our society to be sustainable is for every single CEO of the future to be a social entrepreneur, to be someone that is con committed to its business, but it's also committed to the impact that it has on society. And so when you put these two together, I think we have, from the point of view of our school, we have a strategy that is fundamentally anchored in creating people, developing young talent with a vision that is at the same time accepts technology and all the change that is coming and can take advantage of it, but also in their organizations, in what they do with their everyday lives, they will use that technology, all that data, all those improvements to actually have a strong, positive impact in their society. And this we do at the level of the people and all the ones that I'll come back to in a second, all the people that have been here, all the data science that have come from all around the world, all the people that Laid has mentioned, that has decided to spend part of their vacation working instead of taking time off, have exactly that commitment, which is, again, a society where technology is accepted, is brought in, but where ultimately the focus is on how it can improve the lives of individuals and the harmony within society that makes, it makes us build that progress. So all the people, this is what this movement stands for, and this is a lot of what our school will stand for. And, and this is the way we believe that business schools for the future need to readjust themselves. And the way we will, we, 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 and this is basically the, the reason why when late came into my office, I said, let's go for it. It took us 10 minutes to say we're gonna do it. Pedro gave us tremendous help. And lots of people outside gave us tremendous help. So I want to mention three in particular. Um, first, of course, the municipality of Kashkaj, which has been our partner for now for quite a few years, where in a few months we expect to, uh, to start something great. And so thank you very much for all the support to this. I mean, the municipality of Kashkaj is tremendous. Uh, Mark will talk about it. Tremendously committed to how technology will improve the workings of, of, the, uh, of, of the municipality. José Admiral Saud, who's also been a partner, uh, uh, who's sponsored this, uh, who's, who's, who's sponsored this, uh, this, um, this event, has provided projects, has provided data, and so thank you very much for your support to it. And of course, Zero, where's Zero and CS Research? Where's Zero? I lost him. Oh, hey, you're right there. Also for a lot of your support into, into, into making this happen. Thank you very much for all of you. And I hope that well, and of course, lots of people who laid as mentioned who have been involved in this and partners and Paul's right there sitting right there and all these people that have been involved in this. But I think what I'd like all of you that are sitting here and all those that have participated in this project is that you don't leave and that once you've been here, you realize that this is a great home for those here in Europe and around the world that are have this fundamental concern, which is we need to make sure that the future that technology will bring to us is going to be a future that is marked by social good. And that data, in the end, will be a force for social good. And there's only one way to make sure that techno the technological future will end up bringing about social good. And it is making sure that we train the leaders, we train the managers, we train the CEOs, that will actually, in their minds, put their left and their right brain together and have that impact. And this is something that we as a school want to be part of, and thank you all for being part of this with us. Thank you. So, thank you, Daniel. Um, when, I first come, when I first came to Portugal, uh, entrepreneurship was not the, world, the word that uh, people were telling me and associating with Portugal. But this school, Nova School of Business and Economics, has proven to have uh, entrepreneurial spirit in their blood. Daniel Trassa, Pedro Santa Clara, and others, they're, they're doers. I don't think that I've ever seen such a spirit anywhere else in the world. Uh, but what surprised me the most is that I've seen doers in the public administration. And um, I will invite Marcos Pinheira 
to join me here. And while he is coming, and I'm uh, getting the, the microphone, I'll tell you a similar story that I had with, uh, with Daniel Trassa. I said, Marco, we want to do this. And Marco said, this is exactly what we want to do. Social good, caring about municipality, let's see what we can do to help. You were a fantastic support. Marco, please join me in welcoming this audience. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, allow me to introduce Cascais a little bit, uh, just for the benefit of people that are not present in the room, um, so that you understand the context. So we, our aim is to make Cascais the best place to live uh, a day or a lifetime. And of course, if we want to have the best place to live a day or a lifetime, we need to provide excellent service for the citizens and quality service for the citizens. Our goal is to outperform any pub, uh, private service that you can think of for the benefit of citizens. And of course, we have, in order to achieve that goal, we have to understand data more and more. So think about it. Um, when it comes to social innovation, the institution that is more able has to be more concerned about social innovation has to be a city hall. It's the former government that is closer to the citizens and that can have more impact. And the ultimate goal of a city hall, it is indeed social innovation because at the end needs to solve social problems. So in our world, when we look in, in, the, in the private sector, on the entrepreneurship uh, areas, for instance, VCs evaluate a business when um, one, of, one, one of the ways they evaluate the business is the impact or potential market that a certain product or service can have. So think about a, 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 the public government, uh, government. The impact is 7 billion people. Always. So there's nothing bigger than this. And so whatever we do here in this area really can create a lot of value, really can have a lot of impact, starting with the city, going to the country, going to a continent, and ultimately changing indeed the world. And this is why data is so important to us. The other reason that data is so important to us, and I personally believe that a city hall can only be as good as the data, the quality of the data and the management of the data that it has. And this will be true in the future, more and more. In Cascais, it's so very important that, more, over, more, more even, because we are committed to innovating in public policies and creating here what we call what we we call the, the city co-creation co-creation with whom with the citizens and so we believe that the involvement technology allows us to involve citizens in a way that before was very complicated and now we can do it so we can ultimately have new ways of government new ways of managing the city that are possible if the data that we have is a lot, if the data that we have is good, and if we use it properly. And so that's why it took 10 minutes. <laughs> um, regarding NOVA, of course, um, Danielle was saying that we will start a project, uh, something big. I, I think we already started it. And, um, and nowadays, to talk about Cascais, is to talk about Nova, and to talk about Nova is to talk about Cascais. So we are very excited for all of these projects that we're going to do, that we did, that we're doing, and that we're going to do together. And um, regarding... I have to intervene. Yeah. We have to move with the, uh, with the schedule. No, it's very, it's very fast. Good. Um, <laughs> I had the same time as him. <laughs> um, but anyway, so just, just saying that... Uh, of course, the, the, the problem specifically that we, that we addressed here, um, it's very interesting because we found out there was a lot of challenges 
in handling data, I'm sure in Portugal and so many other countries, because data is everywhere. And so one of the challenges was indeed to understand who owns the data and who can use it. And that was very interesting. And so we'll, we'll continue doing it. Okay. Thank you, Marco, very much for all the help and all the support. I will, uh, I will be more rigorous with the time. I'm sorry. I should have done it uh, in the beginning <laughs> uh, because I know that most of you have a lot of obligations afterwards. Uh, now, and um, what was very, very simple is to go to the public institution and ask them to, to join the project. But as you may, may understand, uh, working with data is very hard. There are so many legal constraints, and uh, people are curious but also afraid. I am uh, very grateful that we had a chance to work uh, in the healthcare-related project, and I'm very grateful to José de Monsaude, and I'm ask, uh, ask Rui Salinas to join me here. Rui and his team, uh, Miguel, Ines, Luis, they were fantastic during this time, and uh, please join me here. Hello. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having us here. It's truly a privilege to be uh, uh, among you. Now, um, I shall make some very simple and quick, hopefully, remarks. Um, basically answering one very simple question, is, which is actually, why did we do it? Because it would seem that we are not, as a private healthcare company, uh, the obvious type, the obvious profile of, a, of an institution organization which would actually join the DSSG project. Now, there is a going myth which I can tell you is not true, that we only did this because Laid twisted our arms into doing this. And this, is, <laughs> and this is not true. Not that without Laid's capacity to do arm twisting, of course, but this is actually not why we did it. We actually did it because we had a business objective that we wanted to reach. And this is a very simple thing. We wanted to have a rule, a method, which pretty much everybody in this audience calls an algorithm or something uh, with a deep uh, technical meaning, um, to allocate, to suggest doctors uh, to patients, namely general practitioners. So the doctor who's not the specialist but the overall person who takes care of one's health. Um, why is this important? Well, because this allows, if we want to uh, look at the uh, jargon side of things, for greater efficiency in care and for greater efficacy in care. But let's leave the mumbo-jumbo uh, words aside. And what does this actually mean for our health and for our well-being? Well, this means two very simple things. Like any of us who have ever been ill will recognize, even though some people in the audience are too young to have ever been ill and to remember it, but those of us who have ever been ill realize that Actually being cured once and for all is a good thing, not a bad thing. And so that is what efficacy means. What efficiency means is that we will be able, hopefully, to do, to do this in a shorter span of time, poking you and prodding you not as much as we would otherwise, so with less discomfort, with less time being taken from you, and with less cost. And so when you add these two together, this efficacy and this efficiency, but basically curing somebody as soon and as uh, with the least inconvenience possible, this is where the good in social, in social good comes in. And this is why we think that it is relevant that we should um, be here with you to uh, address this issue. Now, this is the result. And we still, not to put any pressure on you guys, but we still need to uh, do the handler of, of the algorithm, which I'm sure will be coming in the next few days. I'm but, coming. <laughs> I'm coming. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, but that being said, that is the goal. But the process so far has already been tremendously interesting because it has challenged us internally to see what it was that we could do with the data regarding the um, legal issues, regarding the technical issues of actually providing somebody with a few hundred gigabyte database, which is not with what we do every morning, so it was complicated. But the really interesting part was the discussions which we had with the team. And these discussions were about the technical aspects, the conceptual aspects of what it is that we can call loyalty and transform it into an algorithm. And these discussions, which we have had with uh, Chi Wei, Mang Chi, and uh, Manaz, and Inigo, and Laura, and with Laid, of course, have proven the most interesting aspect of this collaboration. So guys, Thank you very much, one and all. It has truly been a privilege to work with you. And um, we actually intend to do something with this. So 
not to put any pressure again. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. So I guess I have to cut it by myself on my part of the talk. <laughs> but um, I got a remark uh, in a, in a pre-event that people don't know what is data science for social good. It started in 2013 by Raid Ghani, uh, who was the chief data scientist in Obama for, uh, for America 2012. Uh, he understood that there is a lot of data scientists, a lot of talk about data science, but very little in social good. The organizations are not ready, and this is something that already exists, and we need to somehow help in making it happen. And um, it has three pillars, or two pillars. It has training and impact. Training aspiring data scientists, these wonderful fellows that come from all over the world, uh, organizations that are working uh, in social good, and impact, we need to actually do something with it. So thank you, Hui, for uh, sticking to the, to the motto that we, or to the values that we shared initially, and for helping us in making this. And thank you, Marco, as well, because I've already seen impact of, uh, of the project with Marco and the others. Uh, it has already a history. For four years, it has been running in Chicago. Uh, and uh, the uh, interest for data science for social good is great. Over 3,500 applicants. And these are wonderful people. This year we actually went through 500 uh, applications, and um, I was just sad that I cannot bring all of them. It was fantastic. 350 universities, 50 countries, and all together 183 fellows. For the first time, data science for social good year, this year came to EU. We had a 5% acceptance rate. Uh, and I have to say something. People talk whether these projects as Carnegie Mellon Portugal, MIT Portugal, the others actually have impact on the Portuguese society. Well, I can tell you, it was fantastically easy to organize uh, skills and talent here to support this, uh, these fellows just because the existence of the Carnegie Mellon Portugal and the other problems, uh, programs. So I must thank you personally for being uh, a beneficiary of the program and for also having all these uh, smart and talented and skilled and educated people here in Portugal. Um, we made a fantastic group of partners. I mean, you can see some of these. We are so happy to be part of it and to have uh, Portuguese and European institutions as part of the, the partner network of uh, Data Science and Social Good. Uh, this year, these, are, these were the six projects. You know, I can talk about this uh, for a long time, uh, but before I go there, let me tell you something. Uh, for people who don't know where this is happening, Data Science for Social Good Europe is uh, in Cascais. Cascais is a beautiful villa or a city, small city in Portugal. Small just by the dimension, but uh, huge in terms of the vision of what they're doing. And this place is called Casa das Histórias, Museu Paulo Rego. Casa das Histórias in Portuguese means uh, the house of stories. Today, we're going to he hear a set of wonderful stories from our fellows and our speakers. And today, we're going to have them and you with us make a history. So without further ado, I will invite uh, the first of the speakers this year in an experimental program. We call it Data Science for Social Good Students. Uh, Carlos Gonçalves to join me on the stage and while he's getting ready. Uh, can you please come here? I'll tell you a story how Carlos Gonçalves came to the, to the DSSG. Uh, actually, remind me? Diogo. <laughs> I may uh, confuse it. So Diogo came uh, through João Fernandes, our, our uh, staff and, uh, and a colleague helping us. And he said, we want to be part of it. We're not fellows we didn't know, but we want to be part of it now. And then I told them, very good. We have no funding for you guys, and we have no clue who you are. But you know what? We're going to give you a chance. Pick a guy from Technico a master's student, because your undergrad is in economics, do you expect that we can actually get these guys to code and do stuff? And if you prove us right in five weeks, we include in the program. If you prove yourself that you can do something. You know what? I mean, they just exceeded our expectations. Three undergrad students from Nova, plus a master's student from Technico, did a project with the municipality of Rotterdam, and I cannot tell, how mu tell you how much proud am I of them. No pressure. <laughs> Please take the stage. No. Uh, okay. Thank you. Let me just switch it up. Okay. Okay, great. Sorry. 
So hello everyone, um, we're really glad that you're here with us today. My name is Carlos, uh, we're the Rotterdam team, and today we'll be talking about identifying green rooftops in Rotterdam to improve urban planning. Now, sometimes opportunity, it's under our very nose. But for large cities all over the world, actually, that's not the case. It's above, in the rooftops. There are millions of square kilometers of rooftops that are not being used. And it's an opportunity that is really worth considering. Rotterdam isn't an exception, but unlike other cities, being the second largest city in the Netherlands, it's taking a chance. It's looking at its rooftops with more care. Now, a rooftop is a expansion of the public space at the ground level in a multifunctional and sustainable way. And so this really allows cities to address their public urban uh, challenges. And you do this by, for example, looking at Rotterdam and looking at one of its key issues, the fact that there's threats of floods and storm, storm surges. And what really happens here is climate adaptation and water management, their key issues. And so we need to start looking at urban interventions that are good for the city, that are smart, that are innovative, such as green rooftops. And that's why we're here today. So green rooftops, a little quick intro, they're covered vegetation, they have a growing medium, and also, most importantly, they have a waterproofing membrane. It collects water. And so this really allows the city to uh, reduce the stress on the sewage system. It does this by retaining precipitation, by decreasing the speed of the water runoff, and also limiting peak discharge. This is the solution. It's what they have to offer to cities like Rotterdam for their water management puzzle. What? Yeah, sorry. And what we're really trying to do here, ultimately, is look at how can we help Rotterdam do this? There are 11,000 roofs only in the city center. So how can we help Rotterdam efficiently identify this, all of these green roofs. If you have 11,000 roofs, you're not going to go manually from one to the other, right? And what we do is build a model that is able to identify green roofs by classifying them into non-vegetation and vegetation. And so you can see here that nothing is happening really in non-vegetation, but in vegetation there's a variety of plants, it's lush, that's what we want. And so here you have, for example, the satellite imagery that we're using in our model, it's the input. You also have the data that delineates each rooftop with a shape. These are our inputs. Mind you, this is only a subset of our actual area of interest. And so here's the output. Here is what we want. You, we want to have shapes that are gray and that are green. Green means that the model predicted that this is a rooftop with vegetation. Everything else is non-vegetation. And now to our actual area of interest, the city center of Rotterdam. It has about 11,724 rooftops, but what we're looking at here is not the actual count of the rooftops, we're looking at the total area of the rooftops. And this is about 23 kilometers squared, more or less. And so, before we were looking at the small circle, that was the image, and now we're looking at this really big part of Rotterdam. Our model has an accuracy score of 85% in our sample, and this means that when it starts classifying uh, roofs, 95% is non-vegetation and 5 is vegetation. You can see that one vastly outweighs the other, but that's a good thing, because it means that Rotterdam has a lot of room for improvement, like many other cities. But this also allows us to see, for example, that all of the roofs are centered, the green roofs are centered in the heart of the city center. This is really important stuff for urban planning. It's the key. It's what really makes policy effective. And now Rotterdam finally can know if it can grow, which obviously it can, um, and it can know where to grow. So in the beginning, we showed you this rooftop because we wanted you to have a very key look at what we're considering, what our goal is. This is our goal. Now, we want to contribute to Rotterdam where roofscaping is the norm, to Rotterdam that blossoms with these kinds of roofs, multifunctional, sustainable, that can address urban public challenges. Our goal is to go also beyond Rotterdam. We really think that our model, that models like ours, can be applied to other cities. We really think that there's a lot of work to do. 
and we're really happy about it. We want to make a Rotterdam and other cities like Rotterdam look with more attention to the rooftops. Let's ensure that we build a sustainable future for all of our cities. Thank you. It's, it's down, right? This one? This one, this one. So good morning, everyone. My name's Will Grimes, and I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing, along with my wonderful teammates, Ivan and Shubham, uh, looking at using data science to find illegal fishing vessels. So as you may know, our ocean's top predators are in rapid decline. So species like sharks, swordfish, and tuna are thought to have declined by as much as 90% over the past 50 years. Much of this decline can be attributed to destructive fishing practices, including illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. So our project is mainly focused on tuna, and global tuna fishing is particularly out of control. Tuna fish are being caught faster than they're able to reproduce. So global tuna fishing is emptying our oceans of fish, it's harming marine ecosystems, and it's exploiting thousands of workers worldwide. So we've been working in collaboration with the World Economic Forum over the past 12 weeks to try and tackle this problem. Our goal was to uh, create a method that allows us to identify vessels that are fishing in an illegal, unregulated, or unreported way. To do this, we've had an unprecedented collaboration with uh, two of the world's largest satellite imagery providers and a third vessel tracking positional data provider. So this plot we made shows the positional uh, vessel tracking data. We've had access to one year of data, which is about 140 million data points of 500,000 vessels. And our challenge has been to, amongst all these tracks that you can see, find which vessels are fishing vessels, and then create some indicators or components to suggest which vessels may be doing illegal fishing. But how can we do this? Well, this shows uh, two vessel tracks, one for a fishing vessel and a non-fishing vessel. We look at the position and speed and distance from shore and various features to calculate, or we use a machine learning model to predict whether a vessel is a fishing vessel or not. And we can look at each point in its track to see whether it's fishing at that point with our model. On top of this, we use several indicators of illegal fishing. So we look at the probability that it's fishing in a marine protected area, or fishing in the exclusive economic zone of another country, or maybe the vessel is uh, involved in encounters with other vessels, which suggests transshipment. This is where illegal catch is offloaded from one vessel to another. And in the case of tuna, this could make, its way, could make its way up the supply chain and be sold in supermarkets. So we can combine all these components and give a score for each vessel to suggest how likely we think that it's involved in these illegal, unregulated, or unreported fishing behaviors. This positional data, however, is not perfect. Uh, not all fishing vessels will have a transponder that uh, allows us to collect data on its whereabouts, or fishing vessels may also turn off their transponder to engage in these behaviors, and some vessels may even spoof its signal. So we've also been looking at using satellite imagery to capture fishing vessels in the act of illegal fishing. We did this by correlating all of our positional data with satellite imagery to get visual evidence of illegal fishing. And here you can see some of the uh, images that we got. So we combined this all together in a front-end web application that allows uh, NGOs, governments, enforcement agencies, and retailers to check where their fish is being supplied from. So you can select uh, individual vessels and look at the components, whether they've been fishing in these exclusive economic zones or marine protected areas, 
or you can see this unified vessel risk score. So at the moment, data collection on the oceans is pretty scarce. But we're seeing an increasing trend towards data collection with more satellites being put up than ever before and more imagery captured. We hope that with this tool, we're providing a framework by which we give the power to governments, NGOs, retailers, and enforcement agencies so that they can find how their fish is being supplied and tackle this problem of illegal fishing. Thank you very much. So, joining us next, we have, from the bottom of the ocean, uh, Greg Stone. Um, I won't say a lot of words here because you brought a wonderful video to do the introduction, but what I will say is uh, thank you for coming all the way to Cascais and joining us here today. Um, Greg normally spends his uh, time either under the surface of the water or uh, in other faraway places, so you had to travel from very far to join us, and uh, we really look forward to, uh, to having you with us here today. Thank you, Greg. Play that video. Yeah. The ocean is telling us things today. And I think the ocean is telling us that it actually doesn't need us. The ocean is telling us that we need it better stop abusing it. It's going to be here in the future. It may be in a slightly different state or a dramatically different state, but it's not going to go away. Our condition is far more vulnerable. The ocean holds all the cards. My name is Greg Stone, and I'm an oceanographer, marine biologist. I uh, study the ocean, and I work every day to save it. I grew up in, in the outskirts of Boston. I actually didn't live near the ocean, but I was connected to the ocean through TV. I watched Jacques Cousteau documentaries as a kid, and I used to sit there on the living room floor with my mask and flippers on watching these shows. And I used to count the days between Jacques Cousteau documentaries. Finally, I got to the ocean when I was about seven or eight years old for the first time and got to dive into the ocean. I remember I was with my cousin and he lived near the ocean and he had two flippers and two masks. So we each had one flipper and a mask. To this day, I remember the colors of the starfish, the, the, the bracing, wonderful feeling of being in salt water, the waving fronds of kelp and I was totally lost and in love with the ocean from that moment forward. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll just go with this mic here, I think. Okay. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real delight to be here, and uh, what a great turnout. What a great audience of faces I see here. I just had an idea for a piece of software maybe one of you can develop. I always like to try to tune in to the audience that I'm speaking to, and every audience is different. I know there are these, like, crowdsourced, you know, question and answer things, but if there would be a way to tell a speaker when he's on a good note or a good course or a bad course, you know, some way, you know, it would be a great way to adjust your talk to cover things. Because as it is, I'm going to, I'm going to adjust my talk based on what I've heard this morning. So I may skip over a few slides because uh, I'd like to be able to provide you with what I think will be most helpful today. Uh, before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge the Honorable Christine Zinneman, who's in the audience. She's the uh, consul, consulate from Kiribati, which is a very important country, especially for the last presentation. They're the largest atoll nation on the planet, containing most of the tuna in the world, and they're also going to be underwater the next 50 to 100 years from 
uh, sea level rise. Another problem for you to work on. Um, but she'll be here today, and you, I encourage you all to uh, reach out to her. Um, now, I'm going to see if I can get the computer to come back on, because it went to sleep. Uh, the, the title of this talk is Ocean Renaissance. And I'm going to tell you up front why I call it Ocean Renaissance. Um, I'm not a historian, but I got quite uh, fascinated by uh, the Italian, re the uh, European Renaissance. And my basic kind of high school history understanding is that it was a time when, the, when we, humanity, civilization, created some of the first networks, really, that, you know, between creative individuals. We arguably invented science at that time, and we also consolidated the knowledge that we had. And those three factors created a bridge to the present, kind of got us out of the dark, the tail end of the dark ages, and, and delivered us here. I feel that we're in a similar problem today in that we are in, we are in some dark ages. And the ocean, an ocean renaissance, a rediscovery of our dependence, our history, and our connection to the ocean is, the, is going to be our bridge to the future with one difference, and that is that we need to incorporate not just traditional Western knowledge, but indigenous social practices and indigenous knowledge, which I've learned recently has tremendous value <clears throat> as a data source. I used to think indigenous knowledge was important, but quaint. In other words, put it in a museum, <laughs> protect it, understand it. But I've come to know that it's not just quaint, it's actually extremely useful in, at, at the global scale in the world that we're in today. So my background is I'm an oceanographer, and I started, as the film said, as a kid, and I went into traditional oceanographic science. I studied in Antarctica, having to swim around in icebergs, trying to find ways to keep my body warm using kidney heaters, and this was at the beginning of the creation of all those large icebergs down there. I've got a real passion for uh, underwater mountains or seamounts. Uh, there are more mountains in the ocean than there are on land. And these mountains actually have uh, incredible functionality. They, they create currents. They create zones for, um, for, for the tuna that you saw on the last slide. And last year, I was diving on a seamount off the coast of Hawaii. And <clears throat> it's Luihi, which is actually the, the uh, volcano from which all the Hawaiian islands come. And I was down in the uh, caldera. And this beautiful Pacific sleeper shark came by the porthole. Here you see it. And then she came right up to my window. <laughs> and I actually took this picture with my phone. And uh, it's a deep sea shark you only find there. And this gives you a sense of the, uh, the patterns around seamounts and how important these things are. But you know, most people don't even know they exist out there. And th th this is one of, the, one of about five or six big classification of systems in the ocean that I feel need to be studied more. Well, let's not, let's not start there. Let's say we need to consolidate the data that we already have. It has not been consolidated. The oceanographic community is the worst offender of not bringing all their data together. It's all in these silos out there, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a holy grail that's, that should be uh, sought after. But seamounts, the, the uh, diurnal migration, every night in the mesopelagic zone, um, phytoplankton production in different areas, deep water currents, hydrothermal vent systems. There's about five or six of these that have put together, we would have a map of the vital organs of our ocean. And we could begin, perhaps, then, to make sure the ocean continues to provide those benefits to us. Um, my life changed, though, when I was diving down at about 18,000 feet uh, in the Sea of Japan, and I saw this. It was a garbage dump um, on the seafloor. This is not holding there. Perhaps it's more graphic if I tell you about it. We, if you, when you go down into a submarine, I don't know how many, anybody here ever been in a deep sea research sub? Nope, nobody? Okay. <laughs> usually, usually on somebody. Anyway, they're about this big, right? They're about two meters. And there's three people in them, and there's these little teeny portholes, and you just sink down to the bottom. And uh, once you get to the bottom, you drop some weights, then you become neutral and you go around. And it took three hours to get there, a place that literally had not seen the light of day for billions of years, and it was already spoiled. And that was in the 1990s, the early 90s, and my life changed then. 
And I began to direct my, my exploration, my science, and my research to trying to find a way that we can support the ocean so that the ocean can support us in, moder in the modern world. That's the key right there. And you all hold, especially our last speaker, the key to unlocking some of the potential in the ocean. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, <clears throat> this is a, uh, a graphic that shows uh, just surface currents on the ocean from NASA. And I'd just like to show it as this is really, this is like the, f the very thin formica on the top of a table. And that's basically how we understand the ocean from these. And that's the Gulf Stream that comes up and makes Portugal such a nice place to live. It's the, it's the largest heat transport system on the planet. It moves equatorial heat up towards the poles. And it's, uh, it's slowing down uh, about 30% over the last 30, 40 years. And if that thing slows down more, or if it becomes disrupted, which is very likely, the North Atlantic Ocean is the smallest, one of the smallest oceans we have. It's also a cul-de-sac. It's a dead end. So there's not a lot of movement. There's not a lot of room for error. Very, very few degrees of freedom when it comes to systems in the North Atlantic Ocean. And you could argue that all of modern civilization <laughs> is based, modern Western civilization, based on the Gulf Stream. And it's at risk right now. It's at huge risk because it, it's the fundamental to the thermo haline circulation in the ocean and the interactions with the ice. Um, I, I'm assuming that this audience understands that as Buckminster Fuller called the Earth, spaceship Earth, it provides the, the conditions necessary for us to exist here, above all else. And if you want to see planets that don't have an ocean and see what it would be like there, we've got plenty of examples in our own solar system. The ocean provides the conditions from which you derive your food, your oxygen, I've already mentioned climate, livelihoods, um, and it's, it's, it's fundamentally to all life on Earth, it's where life began. It's why you have blood, uh, salt in your blood. You carry the ancient ocean in your blood. And we are, we, are, we are abusing it, even though we've seen over time from space. Every time you look at the Earth, it's blue from the moon. This is the outer edges of our own solar system, the famous pale blue dot photograph that the Voyager took. It turned around, took one last picture of the Earth, and it's one pixel, and it's blue. And all those colors come from not much water. That's, a, that's an accurate uh, volumetric comparison to what the ocean is on our planet. So there's not much of it. And within it, it contains life forms that look like they could come from outer space. These are the earthlings, uh, not us. These are the earthlings. I think if an alien force came to the earth and wanted to find out the most successful, the most abundant, the most systemic life forms, they would go to the ocean. They'd probably bypass us. And it, it, creatures like this, pelagic holothorian, it's a pelagic uh, sea cucumber, or this squid worm that we discovered in the Celebes Sea some years ago. And this is one of my favorite, the Darth Veda jellyfish, I call it. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's an incredible environment out there, and we are connected to it. Recently, some physical anthropologists found these caves in Mossel Bay, South Africa, that are above the, the sea level rise maxima. Sea level rise has been going up and down over the over the um, thousands of years, many hundreds of thousands of millions of years. But, uh, and this one cave system, though, never got washed out. And they went inside it, and they found this evidence of a very rich, detailed ocean culture 200,000 years ago in Africa. And it was a time when Africa was going through a, a natural climate shift, and the interior continent was, was not very agreeable to humans. So a tribe, a group, it's estimated 1,500 to 2,000, the, the physical anthropologists say, moved to the ocean, probably for the first time, and, and began our ocean culture. And it saved us. The ocean saved us. And it's got to have to save us again, because we're sort of in the same place now. The climate, we've messed it up this time. And the ocean is going to be the, the, the solution to, to mitigation, to adaptation, and to to our very survival. Um, and if you look around the world, you know, we went out of Africa, and you can still find plenty of evidence of ocean culture in our natural communities, especially indigenous communities. Anywhere you go along the coastline, 
You will find uh, people that can swim down and dive into the ocean. They gather food. There's the ama pearl divers you see there in the middle. They're always women. Uh, we are very well adapted to the ocean. We are the only animal on the planet that actually can swim a mile, dive down 40 feet, run a mile, and then go climb a tree. Uh, it's quite remarkable. I believe, and this is my own opinion, that the ocean, those, that 130-odd thousand years that we lived in caves and along the coastline, affected us, uh, certainly socially. Uh, it's not a lot of time for significant evolutionary change, but I believe it's one of the reasons that we like the ocean. Now, and this was a picture I took, uh, it was taken in uh, Kiribati, this nation I was talking about with the Honorable uh, Christine Zinnemann just a few weeks ago. This gentleman walked up through the reef flat with these, um, these shrimp, and I thought to myself, Look, at, it's still here. This could have been 200,000 years ago, and it's still going on in different parts of the world. So I've just written a book. I, work, I also work with the World Economic Forum uh, with a colleague, Nishan Dignarian, and we just wrote a book called The Soul of the Sea in the Age of the Algorithm. And it's a manifesto, and it's a manifesto attempting, and I, I hope that we achieve some success in that, in capturing what's going on in this room right now. That is this new age that we're in. And I liked what I heard the first speaker talked about youth. And I also believe that we're in a youth renaissance. I mean, when I grew up, people liked youth, but they liked them for the wrong reasons. <laughs> it, was, it was almost a, a, a hedonistic sort of adoration of youth. But I would argue today we are in a youth renaissance much like perhaps what happened in Portugal during the great era of exploration. If you look at Vasco da Gama, Magellan, and any one of the uh, explorers that I'm familiar with, and there's plenty of representatives of these type of people in India, in Asia, in the South Pacific, they were really young, and they really made it. Um, Vasco da Gama was, he developed his skill set and his peaks and his reputation in his 20s. And Horatio Nelson, the famous uh, English admiral, he was in charge of the whole Caribbean when he was 21 years old. So. We've suddenly come back to a point where we recognize the energy, the spirit, and the drive, and we're unleashing, I believe, the youth, the youth culture on the world. And what I like about it, too, is the youth culture, my, my experience is they want to learn what I know, right? They're very respectful, and they want to spend a lot, they don't want to go the way I went, they want to go their own way, but they want to pick up what they can on their way. And I think that your work in data for social good, uh, and I, I'm, I'm behind you 100%, so in this book, we looked at the history of our relationship with the ocean over time and the effects of the different industrializations, starting really with uh, global whaling. It was the first globalized industry on the planet. We had whale boats going all over the world, bringing back a product, selling it to Europe, selling it to, it started in the United States, and this was the first time that we really started to lean into the ocean for a global industry. Um, and we describe the subsequent impacts of industrialization on the ocean having to do with diesel and steam and a propeller and navigation electronics. But what I'd like to dig into a little bit more here is the recent decadal relationship we've had with the ocean. And we came up with five doctrines. The 1950s, starting in the 50s, was the militarization of the ocean. Right? There's more money spent militarizing the ocean to conduct warfare under the ice and between the, the Cold War powers than was spent during all of World War II. The uh, 1960s was the, uh, what I like to call the Enlightenment, which is the period when a, a young French naval officer, after many attempts in previous centuries and decades to go underwater, to fulfill that wish that probably began in Africa 200,000 years ago, but wasn't realized until the 1960s when Jacques Cousteau, young French naval officer, finally figured out how to bring a compressed tank of air with us underwater and enable us to be there for an extended period of time. And with that came films, with that came books, with that came National Geographic articles, with that came an awareness in the general public of what was going on in the ocean. And then by the end of the 60s, we 
started to see there was something wrong, actually. It was mostly geared towards water pollution that people could see along the coast and animal rights like dead whales and seals. And the, the 1970s was the civil response to the ocean, to ocean awareness. It's when most of the nonprofit organizations like mine, Conservation International, well, I actually start a little bit later, but, but when the groups really got going, Greenpeace, WWF, local groups, it was civil society was the first one to react. Hey, there's an ocean out there. There's something wrong. What are we going to do? The 1980s, well, that was the state response. That's when the law of the sea was signed. And the countries basically said, we own this ocean. And they began some fishery management regimes. They didn't do much with the high seas. It was very, very incomplete. But it was the state response to the awareness that the oceans were important. And then as we turned the corner on the, uh, on the century, really, we've hit the public-private partnership period, which sounds like a throwaway term, but it's, it's really not. It's a time when, the, when, when private sector and public policy need to align. And they haven't been. I mean, I've spent a lot of time at Davos with the World Economic Forum, and I hear CEOs saying, we want rules. We want, we want to know what the margins are for our, for our industry sector. And we don't have them from anywhere. So I think the challenge now is to, you know, combine, we are the public. So when you say public-private partnership, we're talking about ourselves. We need to combine our collective wisdom through our collective governments with the collective activities of the private sector, which is essential to what we call civilization. Now, I personally have a very positive view of the ocean going forward. Uh, this is a graph that I've uh, been... Uh, uh, loaned by uh, Dr. Douglas McCauley, which shows on the left early life in the ocean, and then it shows us beginning to get involved with it. And then on the right is the future. And that's kind of where we are all going right now into the future. And I do, I do fundamentally believe that we can turn this scenario around, which is kind of what's happened. We came out of the ocean and evolved and changed started taking too much of what we want out of the sea, putting too much of what we don't want back into it without any recognition of the symbiotic, the holistic relationship that we have. And I, I kind of wanted to um, close with uh, a quick description of work that I've done on big data, just a couple minutes here. The Phoenix Islands Protected Area is something I was honored to be involved with helping to create in the country of Kiribati. 400,000 square kilometers, and uh, first big ocean reserve ever. Okay, it was a bold new idea. It came from one of the uh, most under-resourced countries in the world. And you can see here the effect of the closure was quite successful. Each of those dots is a uh, fishing boat, and uh, they moved out. Everybody kind of wondered whether they'd move out or not. I mean, <laughs> is it going to make a difference or, or didn't it? And it did. And uh, the previous speaker... Uh, spoke to this and the advances it's going to make, and that's a very, very important part of all this. And then the final uh, piece that I wanted to mention to you all is that um, I was involved with the uh, creation of the Ocean Health Index, uh, which strikes me as a kind of a, a nascent, uh, I see this was on the wrong talk, that's all right, which was a nascent uh, predecessor of yours. and. What we did at the time of the Ocean Health Index was I was really, really tired of metrics that all they did was document the continued decline of the ocean. That's what I had been doing, my colleagues had been doing, and it was a real downer. So we said, we're going to make it a metric that will be a tool to change that pattern. And we decided that the humans, humans had to be part of the metric. So this is not measuring an ocean that's separate from us. It's measuring an ocean of which we are part of that ecosystem. And we lost some of our scientific community over this. That We're in the ivory tower, I call it, and wanted to have a pristine ocean of 2,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago, whatever, however far back you want to go. But the reality is we are never going to go back. So what, as we go forward, we have to be real. We have to have models that account for the way the world works. And what we did is we, we took measures of uh, ecosystem health, and uh, there, were, there were many hundreds of them, and you can see them popping up here on this screen. And they, they'd never been brought together before, so we created a, a model where these were actually consolidated into 10 goals 
of benefits to people, food, climate regulation, livelihood. Uh, we, even, we even used inspiration, things like that, uh, economics. And it's all open sourced, all the data is on the website. And to, to date, about 30 odd countries have adopted this as their national standard for ocean health. There's been presidents who've even run campaigns that I will raise our ocean health index by five points if you elect me. That's what we want. We've got to bring our worlds together, the political worlds, the personal worlds, and most importantly, in this room today, your world. So I thank you all for what you're doing. I believe I'm probably at the end of my time, and uh, it's a real honor to be amongst you, and thank you. So, Christine, uh, Greg pointed you out. Can you raise your hand in case people want to find you afterwards? There she is on that side of the of the room. Thank you. So, th thanks, Greg. Um, it's as you'll uh, notice. What we're trying to do is we're trying to weave the presentations of the DSSG projects with some people who have worked on these kinds of problems. In this case, their entire lives, and it's really also valuable for us to see. Um, how you know some of the work that we spend time on this summer uh, intersects with some of the work that people have really spent a lot of time and effort trying to uh, do and change. So uh, before I invite the next speaker up and I connect the, the hardware here, there's one more point I want to make. So Greg's going to be around afterwards and he brought his book. So um, if you want a signed book by Greg, uh, he will be offering those, selling those in the uh, gallery walk section later in the day. Um, thank you, Late. And then I think uh, it's time for our next speaker, Tarciso. Good morning. My name is Tarciso. I'm part of the Cascais team, uh, together with Kathy and Helga. And we are working with the municipality of Cascais. And also, let me get the picker. Where is it? Uh, and also with Portugal National Unemployment Agency, in the IEFP, to predict who are the people who are at the high risk of becoming long-term unemployed. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here and thank, for, thank the SSG staff and everyone for this great opportunity. We've been so privileged to be working with this Cascais municipality and you everyone. So let me start by telling you a story. So this is João. João is a Portuguese citizen, a man who lives here in Cascais, and he's a 42-year-old. He worked for many, many years in the same company. But one day, sadly, João lost his job. And this brought a lot of stress and difficulties for him and for his family as well. And uh, like, as he has spent so many years doing the same thing in the same job, his options for a new career were quite limited. And he was also not used to looking for a job, so this was even more difficult. And the question is, how can we help people like Jerome? How can we do this? That's exactly what Cascais Municipality wants to do. And they're putting a lot of effort into it. Um, as an unemployed citizen in Cascais, you have several resources that Jerome, for instance, can use to get back into the job market. He can use the Career Resources Program, which offers career counseling and soft skills training. He can also apply for the IEFP, which is the National Unemployment System, and get help from them connecting to companies to get interviews and also getting vocational training to fill in the gaps between his skills and the job market requirements. Um, and the problem is, this is a, you might find this story like very interesting. However, this is a sad story that happens every day here in Portugal. And this is the reality. And it's tough when you are in it. And every year, thousands and thousands of people like João come to those institutions asking for help to find a job. And although they would be pleased to help everyone who comes in searching for help, they, are, they have limited resources. Then how can they prioritize people to make sure they assign the resources to the people who need them the most? That's the goal of our project. 
we actually believe that it, by using the domain knowledge that those institutions acquired, like through many years of experience working with the unemployed population and applying data-driven strategy by using machine learning tools applied to their data, they can provide a better assistance to the people that they work with by being more efficient. So let me tell you what is long-term unemployment. Actually, the Portuguese law defines it as being unemployed for 12 or more months in the system. And if we are able to, at an early stage, predict who are the people who are, who are most likely to become long-term unemployed, we might be able to prevent them from getting there. So let me tell you about our project a little bit. We worked with the data from IEFP uh, in Cascais Municipality from 2007 to 2017. This data consists of basic information about applicants and their interactions with the system, such as trainings and interviews they had with companies and so on. We looked at this data and we created and we built a machine learning model that predicts for a given applicant at a given time what is their risk of becoming long-term unemployed. And this we did by looking at certain characteristics of these applicants, such as age, gender, education level, their unemployment history, as well as their current application and their interactions with the system so far. And the idea is that the higher the risk of being long-term unemployed, that's how long they are going to be long-term unemployed in the future. And so let me just give you an idea of a real use case that our project would be useful for, for these institutions. Uh, suppose that like by October 2015, they wanted to launch a training course for unemployed population here in Cascais. And they had 1,000 spots. So if we look at the data, you see that there were around 5,000 candidates who were available and suitable for this training course. However, we only have 1,000 spots. And they want to make sure they assign those spots for the people who have the highest risk of becoming long-term unemployed so they can prevent those people from going there. If we look at one year later, you see that out of those 5,000 candidates, actually 4 or 5% of those became long-term unemployed. And the question is, how can we select people to make sure that we prioritize them? If we just use the random selection, we would be able to capture around 450 individuals who would be long-term unemployed in the next year. However, by using the results of our project and the model we, de we developed, you were able to get an additional 200 people to this number and then being able to capture 650 people and then being able to be more, much more effective in reaching the people who need the, the, the most help. Um, this way, we believe that by using the results of our project, uh, Cascais Municipality, IEFP, and other partner organizations who also fight long-term unemployment here in Portugal and maybe in other parts of the world will be able to do their work more effectively by helping people like João get a job. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Manas Gaur, and together with my teammates, uh, Mengxin and Inigo, we are working on how can we help uh, patients get the right doctor, the right family doctor, precisely, uh, when they visit the hospital. Basically, we all know that patients uh, trust their doctor, they follow their advice, and this helps them build a long-lasting relationship. But what exactly is the benefit of having a long-lasting relationship? We see that the doctor knows the medical history of the patient, prevents the future complications, and uh, technically, yes, uh, they help them uh, develop a uh, better, healthier life and improve the quality of care. But the question is, how can a patient know who is the right doctor? The patient selection is varied and complex, as we all know, and is influenced by personal as well as external factors. What, is, what are those external factors? We saw that, the, we assume that patient selects a doctor based on the recommendation of the families and friends. They select the doctor based on their online reviews on the website or a lot of many sites on the internet. But sometimes happen like they select the doctor, they go and visit, and the doctor is not available. That's the question is like, the patient fails to see the right doctor. And as a consequence, the patient sees multiple doctors 
and which requires additional consultation time, increase the cost of the health care, and, and the patient doesn't get the right quality of care, and slowly the patient fails to build a long-lasting relationship. Our idea is how can we do a personalized recommendation to the patient so that they can find the right doctor more or less easily. So DSG Europe partners with Jose de Melo Saud in an aim to improve the patient health care in Portugal by providing them a system that recommends the relevant doctors. Jose de Melo Saud is one of the largest private health care network in Portugal, having 18 hospitals and 8,000 doctors serving to 1.5 million patients. We are basically focused on those set of patients, basically which meets family doctors. Our data analyze uh, sum up to like 200,000 interactions with, uh, of 600,000 doctors with nearly 300 family, uh, 600,000 patients with 300,000 300 doctors. This data is completely anonymized, but an insightful analysis of this data helps us to deduce one important fact. The fact is that 40% of the patient visits or sees one doctor, whereas 60% of the patient sees multiple doctors that they change doctors. This seems to be an interesting problem, right? It's from a social good perspective. How can we find the right doctor for this 60% patient population. In order to understand this, we started analyzing this data from an individual patient behavior. Mind it, it's still anonymized. We just see that the patient has, we see that a patient like Sejuana visits a doctor in 2013. She wasn't sure about the treatment of the doctor, visits another doctor for a second opinion in 2014. And she visits him again in 2016. What we see is that how many times Joanna visits the doctor and who she saw recently. What it helps? It helps us in getting an idea that how, like, does she visit the same doctor? If she visited the same doctor, the trust on the doctor is reinforced. But she switches away from the doctor, the trust diminishes. Can we utilize the behavior of Joanna? to recommend the right doctor to Ines. We propose a recommendation model that uses the personal profiles of the Ines, her past interactions, and see how similar the, the behavior of uh, Ines is to Joanna in order to model the trust, the trust Ines has or the doctors she has visited so that we can recommend the top three most relevant doctors to Ines. So, coming back to this, so how can we uh, use this model? This model will help Jose de Melo Saud in helping the patient get the right doctor. Considering the existing scenario, we have 40% patient who stays with the doctor. And if we use the, basically the past interactions the patient have, the frequency and the recency of their past visit, we can recommend 50% more patient population to get to see the right relevant doctors. But if we use a model which uses the features of the patient profile, of their interactions, how similar they are with the previous doctors, previous patients, and the trust that we have, and the trust the patient have on their doctors, we can, prove, we can provide that 60, 67% of the patient can get to see the right relevant doctors. So with this aim, we see that Together, we are really having a trust-based healthcare system that can cast a new light in a patient-doctor relationship. Thank you. Uh, before we continue, uh, you probably ask yourself, when are, going, when are we going to ask the questions to these people? Huh? <laughs> Is there a chance like that? Joanna, please uh, just give me a minute. Well, yes, you will have a chance. Uh, have the patients let the speakers speak, and then we'll have a panel session where you will be able to ask the questions to uh, the speakers and to the presenters. And after this, we will serve a light lunch and have these all groups 
uh, with their posters and their models available to you to exchange uh, ideas with them, to ask them how they did it, everything that they, that they did. And now I have the pleasure uh, to invite Joanna Sa, who is the principal investigator at the Gulbenkian Institute of Science. Is this correct? Good. Uh, it is uh, my great pleasure to invite her because she is, a, besides she is a wonderful speaker and a great scientist, she's also demonstrating that data science for social good is happening not only uh, with us, but that there is a strong community all around the world. And it makes us proud to be part of this community. Joana, would you like to share with us some of your thoughts on uh, using data for understanding health-related behavior? Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. What do you need? So, first of all, I'd really like to thank Special Elite for the opportunity not only first to meet the fellows, uh, but now to be here as well. And uh, I'm going to change my slides as well a little bit, so I'm going to skip over some of them because I, I want to, especially for the fellows, I want to tell a little bit about why I'm doing this. Okay? So I, I have an unusual background. I'm uh, trained as a physicist, and then I have a PhD in molecular biology. And I was actually living in Boston at the time, in 2008, when the financial crisis hit. And it was pretty amazing what was going on in the United States, with lots of people losing their jobs before it hit here in Portugal. And it was quite scary to realize that politicians had pretty much no idea how to deal with it. Okay, so you have like half of the economists who are saying one thing, and I, I apologize, but I know I'm talking to economists here, or mostly, and then the other half would say a completely different thing, and they couldn't seem to agree. And for a biologist or a physicist, this was quite scary, because we were used to going to the lab or to have some models and to figure out to, to what would work and what would not work, and it didn't seem to we, weren't, we didn't seem to be able to do it in the real world in a, in a crisis situation. So I actually started thinking, uh, what, what, in which situation, what could I do with my set, my set of skills, which was unusual, and to have more impact or to have something that would help politicians make these types of decisions. And the idea that I had at the time was that actually it was through data and through the analysis of human behavior in a large scale that finally the internet and other sources of data allowed us to do. So what I'm going to be talking about is a way of actually using this type of data science for what I consider could be a social good from a very specific perspective, okay? And the perspective is that we have to make decisions in our daily lives, all of us have to, and then, and we have a lot of unknowns, and we have a lot of questions while we're trying to make these decisions. But then there are these really important people uh, that I depict here in gray, and th these ones are a little bit bigger because they are the politicians, they are the Marcos of the world, and they are making decisions on our behalf, okay? So their decisions count a little bit more than our individual ones. And well, I started thinking, if I were Marco, or if I were a politician, what, what type of information, sorry, about this? What type of information would I have to, to would I have to have it on my behalf so that I'll solve problems such as this one? And this is a very simple problem. It, it's, it happens every year, which is the fact that hospitals get flooded with seasonal diseases like influenza. So we know the flu is coming, but we don't know exactly when, and we don't know how hard it's going to be or how, deep, how many cases I'm going to have. And I need to prepare for it. I need to prepare my hospital so that I don't see this. So that I don't see these uh, flooded hospitals every single year. So if I am my politician and I have to take into consideration a lot of different factors, economics, of course, and health and emotional, what do you, and so that I can decide uh, what is going to be my line of action, what I find actually is that I don't have the data mostly. I don't have the data here so that I, I can integrate it in my head and then make my decision, whether I'm going to call more doctors, whether I'm going to order more Tamiflu, whatever it is. Okay? So, we basically, mostly politicians are faced with question marks. And what we need to provide as scientists or as a community sometimes, it's this type of information so that they can make their appropriate decisions. So in my research group, this is what we do. We use a lot of data, a lot of different data sources. We think about problems in a, the most integrated way that we can do, and we try to see if we can understand collective behavior, behavior to aid in political decision. And I'll, I, we've been working on things such as uh, understanding sexual profiles. When is it more likely that we're going to have um, AIDS or people showing up at the emergency room asking for abortions? Or uh, understanding the flu, which is the example that I'll give now, but also depression and anxiety. 
and we also try to understand how the decisions are being made, actually. So we try to understand how is it that the politicians are debating and how is it that they're integrating the information and making the decision. And then finally, we're trying to make sure that someone listens. So someone at the other side, the, the markers of the world will listen to what we're saying, which seems to be the case here, but not necessarily in general. Okay? So how, what can we do? And I'll, I'll, go through, I'll go through the problem very uh, quick. The, uh, this is a, you know that the influenza is, is happening. We don't know exactly when. We don't know all of these things. And these are examples from Portugal, from different seasons. So each line corresponds to a different season. And what you can see here is that it, sometimes the peak is very high. Sometimes the peak is very flat. Sometimes it happens early in the season. Sometimes it happens late in the season. And we cannot anticipate. And if you see these lines here in the bottom, what they show is actually when the official alert was given. And when the official alert is given is when hospitals prepare, is when people start uh, um, uh, expecting the flood into the hospitals. And what you'll see is that sometimes it's like really at the peak and sometimes even past the peak. Okay, so the doctors already know that the flu, flu is here once they get a notice from the ministry. And they, they could tell them. So the way this is done is a very slow process. I won't go through it for time's sake, but to, the way it happens is that even if everything goes perfectly, if everything goes as fast as possible, you have at least a two-week delay between the beginning of the flu, so beginning the, between w when it starts going up and, actu and the actual alert. And it varies a lot from season to season. So in this season, it was pretty easy to anticipate. In this season, from one week to the other, we had already more cases than the peak of the entire uh, previous season combined. So what we've done is that we've been using, and this is actually data from Boston Somerville, uh, on trying to predict the peak in each of these uh, um, uh, lines is one prediction, and then the orange line is actually what happened. And the, the, this, this is to show, and this won the Center for Disease Control in the United States Award for the best predictor of the flu season. So this is to show that this is a, a very si difficult problem to understand. So what Miguel, the postdoc in the group did, together with different people, is that it defines the model, and what the model does is that it fits a curve. It fits a curve so that we can identify exactly when it started. Okay? So we now know when it started, and what we've managed to do with some effort <laughs> was to first see it started here, and I do it for the past season, so I do it for the past, and I know that this is the case now. And then what I do is that we try to figure out a way of doing it in real time. Okay? of doing it in real time. And this is the, and to do it in real time, what we're doing is that we're using completely different data sources. And we're doing data sources that, such as Google, Google, oh, sorry, this is a weird clicker. <sighs> okay, so the idea here is that before people go to the doctor, they actually go online. So if you start feeling influenza symptoms like flu, like fever or cold or a shiver, before calling the doctor or doing anything else, you go on Google and you Google these symptoms. So if I can track the way you search for things on Google, I can anticipate the flu season coming. If I see a lot of people going on Google and searching for dummy flu or searching for fever or searching for cold or searching for whatever it is, I can, I can see it going up. So these are different searches on Google for different uh, um, uh, terms or words that we thought, like cough, uh, this is in Italy, but we did it for several different European countries, fever, um, a cold, and if we can track this, the variation in these words, we can track the flu season. And then we also added a data source that is fantastic and exists only in Portugal, which is a, a phone line called Health24. It's a phone line that you can call to ask for medical advice, and it's uh, 24 hours, and you have trained nurse practitioners on the other side collecting all of this health-related information for everyone who, who decides to call. They also include demographics. So we have a very rich data source here that doesn't exist anywhere else that we can use to track things from anxiety to flu to any contagious diseases. And we've been looking at how we can use this system to, to track a lot of different uh, issues with actually a lot of su success. And we managed to use this system or this model and use machine learning and this of algorithms, to, uh, uh, and we were able to do it 
with, with great success. But the thing that I want to, and we are anticipating official alerts in eight European countries by an average of six weeks, so that's a m month and a half uh, from the, the current alert uh, that we can give the authorities. And now the important part, the slide that I would like to get into, which is the fact that we could do this together with the Portuguese authorities. So we were, we were able to provide um, a weekly bulletin where we gave the probability the probability of having, when we pass this threshold, we say, okay, we think it's really coming. So we, we could offer a probability that the flu season was starting and that they, would, they could listen and anticipate and make their system faster. And uh, in the year 2015, 2016, actually, the, we, said till, we, we said it started on one week and the official alert was given the following week. Uh, so we think it's, it's working. And this was what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, this is it's enough. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joana. Uh, Joana gave a wonderful talk at uh, DSSG, and uh, I'm sorry for reducing it, but we are short on time. Now, let's talk about sustainable tourism and uh, Momin Malik. Thank you. Slides. Um, before we start, just a raise of hands. How many people here have been a tourist? And how many people have been felt or ever thought, ah, oh, tourists are so annoying. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I am from, are we ready? Not yet. I keep going? Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, so I'm from the uh, Tuscany team. We've been looking at tourism. And uh, this is a problem that places across the world are facing. Tourism is wonderful, but it's at a point where there are just too many tourists. Uh, this is because the world population is growing, more people have the means to travel. High-speed rails and budget airlines means that more people have opportunities and even changes in accommodations like Airbnb and information online means people know where they want to go. Uh, the problem is that, yes, it can be a real load on different places. Uh, there have been protests all this summer uh, across Europe. Earlier in the uh, summer in July in Venice, there were protests. Uh, there have been a lot of protests in Barcelona, people very upset about the load of tourism. And more recently in Croatia as well, people have been uh, protesting tourists. Here in Portugal as well, Lisbon has been feeling the, the uh, influx of tourists and people are starting to get nervous and thinking about what's the impact on our lives, how is this going to go in the future. Cities have tried different uh, things to, in response. So some cities have tried banning things. Uh, Venice and Colau in Croatia have tried banning new accommodations for tourists. Barcelona has tried banning segways because that was something that people are finding really annoying. Uh, Milan during the summer months has banned food trucks and selfie sticks. Uh, other places like Rome and Havar in Croatia have levied high fines up to 700 euros for different behaviors like being you know, publicly intoxicated at night. Uh, Machu Picchu in Peru has finally instituted timed entry tickets and a limit of 2,500 people per day. And in Dubrovnik, Croatia, people have uh, now installed security cameras across the city center to count the number of people and then limit, stop people from coming in if there's too many. These are all uh, potential solutions, but people are scrambling to try to figure out how to respond, uh, how to be proactive about this. And some of the recommendations or the best practices are to try to manage crowds, try to encourage people to go beyond just the central sites in the city center, and lastly, to encourage tourists to diversify their activities. The setting that we're doing to look at this in is the beautiful city of Florence, Tuscany, the birthplace of the Renaissance and 800 years of art and culture and history. Uh, Florence as well has been experiencing an influx of tourists in the previous years. It's not as bad as other places, but still, over the summer months, every three people has about one tourist. So uh, locals are starting to really notice this presence. Our partners for this are first uh, Toscana Promizione, the regional agency responsible for promoting tourism in Tuscany. They've provided us with several data sets. Uh, what I'll focus on here is the Firenze card. The Firenze card is 72 euros for 72 hours to 72 museums. It's the museum pass. The logs from that let us know who went to which museums in which orders in what uh, <clears throat> sequence over time. 
And second, from Vodafone Italy, we have anonymized records of cell phone towers. So when calls are made or received, they pass through towers, and we know where those towers are, not where the individual people were, but just the tower contacted and when. So through these, we're able to get, for the first time, a picture of what the flows of a daily uh, activity in Florence look like. So um, I apologize, the resolution is a bit low, but you can get a sense of how people are flowing into the center city, heavily concentrated there, and then flowing out as a lot of people leave the city after the day is over. Um, with this, we can then get a sense of where people are at what, type of, uh, what times of the day. We're also able to, for the first time, count the number of day trippers. Now, this is something that cities are experiencing much more with things like high-speed rails, that people only come for a day. Traditional counts of tourists rely on accommodations data, overnights at hotels, which completely misses the number of people who come only for the day, for only a few hours. And in fact, we find that that's probably the majority of people who stay for a day or less. So for the first time, we're able to say, yes, your intuitions about these people who come in for a few hours, it's correct. These are making up the bulk of the people who are staying here. Looking at the forensic card data, we can look at what these people are doing. Uh, Florence has many famous sites. Um, Michelangelo's David is located in the Uffizi Gallery. Um, Botticelli's Birth of Venus is located, or, sorry, Botticelli's Birth of Venus is in the Uffizi, Michelangelo's David is in Academia. Uh, and the Opera del Duomo is where Bruno Lesci's famous dome is. And these are the three really large museums there. And they might make up a large portion of what people are going. This shows the sets of museums visited uh, on single Ferenzi cards. The majority or the most frequent pattern is visiting only the three major museums. And then the other patterns include visiting only the Duomo. So paying 72 euros to visit one museum. Why is that? It lets you skip lines. So this is more evidence of people uh, only coming in for a day and valuing their short time so much that they're willing to spend this much money to not have to spend the time waiting in line. Some of the other patterns, we also see that people who are seeing three, four, five museums do it on one day. Not the full 72 hours, but just on one day, which is again pointing more to people spending only a day there, going and seeing things very rapidly. So what can we do about this? We've put together some recommendations for our partners in uh, Toscana that says, okay, there are different museums with different time series. Certain ones are more busy at certain times of day. Others are less busy. If we can inform tourists about these patterns, we can say, maybe instead of waiting in line for this museum, you can go here in the meantime. We can tell people, if you have been to these museums, maybe you'll be interested in seeing these other museums, some other of Michelangelo's work, if you're interested in, the, in David. Uh, there's a Ferenzi card app, there are tourist information centers, and these can be some of the sites of interventions. We've also put together some interactive visualizations, and we will have those on display for you outside, that give a sense of where tourists are moving to and from, both between museums, which is shown on the left, and in areas of the city, which is shown on the right from the uh, telecommunications data. Ultimately, what we hope to be able to do is to, or what we have tried to do is to take this data and use our analysis to get some understandings of what the tourists look like in Florence in a typical day over the summer. Uh, with these, we've now suggested some possible interventions that can be then tested out. And with all this data we have, we can have a sense of, is it working? Is it accomplishing what we want to do? And with this, we hope to be able to help the city of Florence and Tuscany to plan a future of sustainable tourism. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Moeen. Yeah. Uh, now I will share on one more exciting project, if not the most exciting. Yep. <laughs> okay. Together with my amazing team, Sefi and Victor, we work on improving incident, traffic incident response in the Netherlands over the last three months uh, under the mentorship of Jane and Paul. So everyday incidents occur on roads, and these can be small minor incidents such as car breakdowns or major ones that lead to casualties. And this can cause us a lot of stress, be it for the people who are waiting for help or for people, impatient people like Sefi or me who gets anxious when we get stuck in traffic. So in the Netherlands, there are approximately 120,000 incidents that um, occurs on the roads. And if, if we look at historical data, we can see an increasing trend across the years. And this actually um, is a challenge for our partner, 
um, Rick's Waterstat, which is the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment. So their job is to ensure road safety, and their mission is to and, um, promote safety, mobility, and quality of life in the Netherlands. And we got to visit the Netherlands to understand more about their work. And that is um, me yeah, getting to be a traffic inspector for one hour. <laughs> yep. So we'll take a look at what exactly happens, how they cope with incidents with the use of traffic inspectors. When an incident occurs, the traffic center receives a call and inspectors on patrol get dispatched to the site based on their proximity and availability. And when the inspector reach the location, they try to secure the site and coordinate safety services in order to resolve the incidents as fast as possible. So using data science, what we try to do over here is to minimize the time it takes from the traffic dispatch time to the traffic, the inspector arrival time. Basically what we are trying to do is to minimize the travel time it takes from one point to the other. So um, with our partner, we decided as a pilot to focus on the Rotterdam area. And there's no conspiracy here with the Rotterdam team. It just so happens that they have a very big and busy port. And this is associated with the growing number of job opportunities in the area. And also they have a lot of tunnels and highways which increase the tendency of incidents. So looking at this area, there's a total stretch of 390 kilometers. And currently there are 15 inspectors being deployed to cover these areas. So basically they patrol around and will respond to an incident whenever one occurs. So the question for us is how do we deploy them or how do we station their um, patrolling areas yeah, where, where they should go? So looking at historical data over the last three years, we try to identify spots that are more likely to have incidents. And also we acquire data online relating to the travel time between all possible points in this particular road network. And then we implemented an optimization algorithm that gives us the best inspector locations where they should be covering or patrolling. So using two years of September data, um, 2015 and 2016, we are able to come up with a plan that um, identifies where they should be stationed or patrolling. So over here you can see the stars represent the inspector locations and the color itself corresponds to where they should where each officer should be covering. Yeah, and after we come up with this plan, we implemented it on the October 2016 data to see the performance, and we realized a 30% reduction in the mean travel time uh, in general, so from 12 minutes to 8 minutes. Apart from assessing the current strength performance, we also looked at um, whether it's possible to do more with less. So we looked, we analyzed the trade-off in performance um, and the number of inspectors. So over here, this is especially um, important for our partners because with the growing number of incidents, our algorithm can then help them to be able to cope with this current trend. Yep. And we are really excited to be able to implement our solutions for the upcoming months in September and October. And after successfully implementing our algorithm, we hope to be able to scale it to the whole of the Netherlands and possible to other countries to keep roads safe and traffic free. Over here, um, I would like to give it up for my team and the dedicated traffic inspectors. Yep. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Hui. So we're about five minutes away um, to start the panel session. And what, we, um, what we've done now is basically, uh, what you've seen is you've seen all the projects present. And this is after 12 weeks of full-time work of these fellows working with the partners and coming up uh, with a data science solution to their problem. Um, but what happens next? And so uh, how, do you get, how do you actually get these algorithms implemented in the real world? So we've asked Prudencio, who is a colleague of mine at McKinsey, who uh, works uh, on implementing some of these kinds of projects uh, with uh, some of the McKinsey clients uh, every day uh, to talk a little bit about some of, some of the challenges and things that you need to think about as you uh, move to the next step of implementation. So Prudencio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Paul, uh, slide. Yeah, it's, uh, 
Ah, it's the next one. Okay, great. No, no, just, just one. This one? Yeah. Here we go. Well, Paul has a great way of putting pressure on the presenter, just saying that we are five minutes away from the next session. It's a great way to do it. Anyway, uh, a quick question before I give my uh, short presentation on one slide. Who considers himself a data scientist? Can you raise your hand? Great, it's a good balance. So I'm not a data scientist myself, so for those of you who are not, you will try, I will try to make myself understand. Also, I have to say, I work with data scientists all the time, so I'm in a, you know, in a mixed role. Having said that, uh, when I was uh, speaking with Paul before coming here, he asked me, can you actually tell how does it look like to work at McKinsey on advanced analytics projects? What are the types of challenges that we are facing? And actually, can you share you know, one, two cases? Uh, it's great that I'm not presenting cases because your cases are much more exciting than the ones I would present. So let me just focus on how do we think about advanced analytics at McKinsey. We work you know, in the private sector, as many of you will know, but we also work with the public sector. And I have to say that this framework, uh, which consultants uh, love, applies to both worlds. Okay? So let me spend 45 seconds, one minute, just going through each of the steps and sharing with you what I have learned after working for almost five years with data scientists, with companies, and to some extent with also the public sector. First thing is that uh, you need to understand the source of value. Either data scientists or people who are interested in advanced analytics, it's great to have an idea, but that idea needs to be explained in very concrete terms, and you need to understand what you're trying to solve for. Otherwise, you would do a very exciting thing, but in the end, you might not be able to achieve impact to achieve change. Okay? And if you have that idea clear, also you need to understand you need to bring the right stakeholders into the whole process. Okay? You might have, I might have a great idea, uh, but if I don't have the people who make the decisions on the table working with me, then I will have a great recommendation, but maybe I will not be able to achieve impact. So again, having a very clear idea and having the right people in the room. The second thing that you need to do when you're working with advanced analytics, of course, is having the data. Okay? That's uh, obvious. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing advanced analytics. Here, my only recommendation is that in today's world, we have tons of data. The problem is actually knowing what is the right data and who has the right data. Okay? So I wouldn't say that you as data scientists or people who are interested shouldn't be focused on, I need to get those gigabytes of data. I want to have terabytes. I want to do Amazon Cloud. No. What you need to ask yourself is, what is the data that I need to actually solve the problem that I have at hand? That is the question that you need to pose. Third thing, you need to build a model, okay? And here, to those of you who are data scientists, it's great to have models that have great accuracy, that have Gini curves that are almost perfect, that the confusion matrix is great. In the end, if you are working for the public sector and they have to make a decision, they want to understand what is the basis for that decision. So it's great to use machine learning, it's great to use all those things, but don't think that just by using those words and by giving those results, people will believe in you. What you actually have to do is, you need to explain them what is behind that data, what is the logic that you are trying to implement. That way, they will be much more comfortable on making decisions that actually affect a lot of people. So again, it's great to use great algorithms, but in the end, you need to break the black box concern and actually give the ones who make decisions, let's say, uh, in Spain we say tranquilidad, that um, they are making it based on sound fundamentals and not just you know, uh, tons of algorithms working around the computer. The fourth thing is you can have a great model. Okay? I have seen six presentations which are great, but in the end we need to change something. Okay? Otherwise, we will have a fantastic presentation, but again, we are trying to reduce the, you know, from 15 to 8 minutes. We are trying to move from 40 to 67%. Those things are great. But in the end, you have to think that at the other side, okay, beyond the PowerPoint, and it's funny that a consultant says that, there is actually something that you really need to change. Okay? So again, myself working in advanced analytics, the thing that I have to tell you that is most difficult is to move from a great model, some great insights, to actually having people changing the way they operate. And this relates to number five. You might have, let's say, a great way of doing things, which is actually better. 
do not underestimate the fact that people like to do the things the way they used to do it in the past. And actually, we working in advanced analytics believe that we have the truth, you know? Actually, data supports that we can do it better. The mistake that I have seen make the most is that just by having that, we believe that things will change. Actually, the last step, making sure that you have a great idea, but that you move it into implementation, is convincing the people that this is better, okay? Making sure that you understand how they think, making sure to understand how they decide things. That way, you will be able to achieve impact. And I think that those ideas that you have presented are great, you have the fundamentals, you have gone one, two, three, and starting to four, but making sure that achieving impact requires going through the value chain. And one last thing that I wanted to mention is some of the things that we have shared during these uh, you know, sessions have a lot of elements of data scientists, but also have elements of people who understand the public sector, people who understand how even the private sector work, people who understand how many stakeholders in the society work. So again, I would say take this with you, but also take a second important message. If you really want to apply advanced analytics, this is not the work of a data scientist. And I really like the, the, the logo, no? the data science for social good. It, does, it doesn't say data scientists for social good. It says data science. Because if you really want to achieve social good with data science, you need the data scientists, you need people from the public sector, you probably need people from the private sector who understand how it works, you need people who devote their lives for research, you need a whole ecosystem of people working together to actually achieve impact. And I think, again, that this is a great story. I have to say that I'm very much impressed with all that you are doing and uh, really looking forward to see how it works. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prudencio. Um, with that, I'd like to invite uh, Joanna, Greg, up to the stage, as well as Jane and uh, Mengshin. Uh, what we'll do now is we'll have a, a short panel with the time that we have left to give you the opportunity to ask um, the speakers some questions about the projects, but also about some of the presentations that they gave. Um, so we'll have six panelists, three of, them which, uh, uh, three of whom you haven't met yet. So, Jane is one of the technical mentors uh, that has been with us uh, in the summer, who was also involved in previous DSSGs in Chicago and has been helping the teams on the technical challenges. Then we had Mengshin, who was uh, on the Jose de Medel Saud uh, project as one of the fellows. And we have Tiago here, who was on the Rotterdam project, as he likes to call it, uh, the one and only, um, who was also with us uh, uh, the whole summer. Okay. One more chair. Yeah, I'll take this. So I've been involved with various DSSGs over the past couple of years, and I must say this was a, a really uh, fun addition and, 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 and really interesting, from at least from my perspective, to try and see what it would take to uh, take the concept of data science for social good, which started uh, uh, with Raid Ghani in, in, in Chicago, and bring it uh, uh, to Europe. And so I think uh, after today, I feel a little bit more comfortable saying that we did it. Uh, now, as the, <laughs> as the presentations are over, uh, it feels like we, we were able to do that with all of your help. And before we go to the questions of the audience, I have one question uh, for any of the three cl sitting closest to me. Uh, can you describe uh, to the people in the room what the experience of working on DSSG for the 12 weeks full-time was like? Maybe Tiago? Okay, so I'll talk a bit from the experience of a student of the SSG. Um, it might not be the same experience for the others, uh, but it was an epic. Um, it was a humbling process, like a daily humbling process. You had incredible people around you. We were always talking about interesting things with great impact, with great reach. Um, it, was, it was really difficult, but it was actually one of the most uh, happy moments, I think, of our life, of our of our academic lives because it all, everything was really interesting. Everything had an impact and we could reach, it was palpable. So we learned a lot of things. We talked to our partners uh, and we tried to apply as well as we could some, some kind of solutions and we hope they are going to be implemented or at least be proved as a proof of concept. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would definitely echo everything that Tiago said and um, that it's very fun 
I think that's the, the main thing. It's like the best summer camp that there ever was. Uh, and I like that it's very dynamic. So um, we'll be doing everything from planning an event like this to uh, spinning up AWS instances um, to doing deep dive presentations. Um, so it's, we're doing something different every day. And it's, I think, really interesting and fun because of that. Um, for me, because I always claim I'm a data scientist, but actually, for now, I think this is the, the past three months is my first experience to work as a data scientist on a project from end to end. Because in previous, uh, in my school time, I always I have learned a lot of fancy models, fancy algorithm in data science in machine learning, but actually for the project, it's just a well-defined problem for us, not like the past three months, we are given the real world, real business data, and we want to transfer the problem into a data science framework. So for me, it's, um, this fellowship is more like learning by, uh, learning by doing process. Yeah. Great, so maybe with that, we can open it up for questions uh, from the audience, if there are any burning questions. A couple of hands. I don't know if we have microphones going around. So here's a uh, microphone here, and then there's another microphone Okay, let's start with uh, that side. Hi, um, this is a question to the last speaker. Uh, the first uh, Maybe step, if you could introduce yourself as well. Sure, yeah. My name is Nikhil. I'm a tourist, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the question is to the last speaker. You said the step one was uh, demonstrating the value, something along those lines. And uh, my question is, in the social space, I think uh, value is pretty subjective. You know, I can understand in a private setting, you've got a company that says, well, this is the value of the project we want to do. But in a social setting, since it's so subjective, how do you um, prioritize what you're trying to solve? So for example, in the case of the tourism project, whose value are you trying to, to solve? You know, there's, uh, some people might actually like the fact that there's a lot of tourists, and uh, maybe the locals don't like it. So how do you figure that out before you go to the next steps? Okay, so I would say that um, the great thing about uh, identifying the value when it comes to advanced analytics is that it's very qualitative. So it's a kind of a contradiction in terms, no? So um, I don't have a formula to tell you what is the exact value that something uh, will have. I, what I really believe is that if you find uh, a social issue that uh, has a lot of people who care about it, it is already justified. And what you really need to identify is who are those who believe that has social value and who are those who can actually, let's say, who are the enablers to actually cap capture that social value. So whether it's a thousand people, a million people, or a hundred million people, I mean, it depends on the issue. Uh, for example, on your presentation, Professor, I had no idea about the, you know, the issues that you mentioned. Um, but now that I've heard, uh, I would say I believe. So it is very subjective. Many, may, maybe only a thousand people know that this is a social problem that is huge, uh, but in the end it affects to millions of them. So I would say that working in public sector also has an element of, uh, let's say, caring for society that makes you work for people to understand that is great social value. So uh, again, it's a very undefined question. And again, I would like to transfer the question to you, Professor, to say, how do you actually make it to convince people that, um, you know, that this is actually a real problem? Because many of us have no idea or actually it doesn't apply to our daily life. So, you know, we have more immediate problems than that. Sure. It's, uh, I'm going to give you a fairly simple answer because this is what I've discovered, is you need to have a public communication component to, to an issue, and you need to have a stack of science papers over in the corner somewhere that you can point to that no one's going to read, but they believe you. You tell them what's in the science. And, and, that, that, and that's really kind of what I, what the, the, the epiphany that came to me er, earlier in my career. I said, when my days are gone, do I want to have them represented by a stack of science papers that maybe 15 people would read one of them, maybe if I was lucky, 50 might read one other one. Or do I want to see that translate into something else? So you need to have the public communication. And some of the initiatives I've been involved with, I would say the turning point was a 15-minute was a film. 
that I showed to leaders about the issue. Now, if the, fi if the film didn't have that stack of science papers somewhere, it wouldn't be as effective. But the science papers alone are often, like, flat. So it, communication, communication, communication. So, Greg, maybe as a follow-up question, because I think this is a really great question. We've spent 12 weeks with a team working on, one of the teams working on a subject that's very close to your heart, problem you've been trying to work on mm -hmm. your entire life. Mm -hmm. What's the value of what they've done to your problem? Well, it's, 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 it's fantastic. I got all excited down there when I, when, I, when I read the poster and then I saw the presentation and I, I can't wait to, uh, to get at it. I, 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 need to, I need to get at it a little bit more. I guess it's like, you know, somebody likes ice cream. I just saw another two dozen flavors I never knew existed. I mean, I mean, I mean there's, been, there's been work done in this area by um, Oceana and the Pew Charitable Trust and Google and whatnot, but, but we need more. And, I, and, I, and I'm aware of some of, the, um, some of the matching you've done between physical images, I believe, and the tracks of the ships, which is new. Uh, and so I'm very, very excited. And this is the future of that issue. And then there's another four or five that I'd like you to start working on next, right, right after that. Next question. Maybe this uh, gentleman in the blue shirt. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is James Kemmel. I work with a company called Inmarsat, which is a big satellite connectivity provider. Um, I've also been working on fisheries conservation in Indonesia for the last couple of years as well. So really welcomed the focus on IUU fisheries. I'd appreciate a comment from, um, from Dr. Stone, really on where you see that initiative going next. Um, particularly how you start to see it dealing with some of the challenges w that were raised in the, uh, in the final presentation around adoption. Uh, typically from the experience that we've had, people tend to focus on fisheries control in a sort of very much a stick sort of way. And of course you want to stop people breaking the law and you want to start bringing them to justice, but you also need a certain amount of cooperation and consent from the fisheries community themselves. And I think that's probably one of the more intractable intractable issues to deal with. I'd really appreciate your, your, your views. Well, I, I think on the fisheries, uh, illegal, the, the term it's used is IUU, which is illegal, unreported, and unregulated, but it's essentially all illegal. Because if you underreport or you don't regulate appropriately, that usually violate some law. Uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a turning point, it was, it was a tipping point. And tipping points is another very important discussion point to have. Uh, a few years ago when AIS, VMS got consolidated and there was that map I showed you actually, that map's been shown so often as that tipping point, that turning point in understanding this. So in my view actually, we've turned the corner on IUU fishing. Now it's a question of, I call it unpacking the truck. By that I mean we have everything there, we now just have to go through the process of unpacking it coming up with the evidence that a country will need to uh, prosecute an illegal boat, coming up with uh, the, 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 big, the big problem has kind of been broken through, and now we're, we're sort of on our way. So the next steps, evidence that the Indonesia can use. Well, Indonesia's got a great strategy. I, I know the minister there, I was with her recently. She, uh, talking about communication, she confiscated an illegal fishing boat, then she blew it up. <laughs> And it got everybody's attention. Brilliant strategy. Brilliant. I mean, it had no functional reality to it, but that got everybody's attention. And Palau started doing that, too. So I'm more interested now. I'd like to turn your question into something else in, in value sharing of these resources. Because currently the international system does not equitably share the value of the fishery resources with the nations from which the fish come. And this, this to me, is the next the next hurdle that we do not know how to do. Let me give you a quick example. That country of Kiribati I mentioned earlier that has so much fish, the, way, the, the, the value of that fish as it goes up through the value chain is $4 billion a year, tuna alone, from this one nation of 100,000 people. It's a least developed country. They, they receive $60 million of that value chain. It's, it's, it would be like going to Saudi Arabia drilling the oil out of the ground for five cents on the dollar and then saying, oh, don't, wor don't worry about refining it, we'll take care of that too. But the Saudis, when BP came there around World War I, they, the same proposition was made to the Saudis saying, or I guess they weren't Saudis then, it was, it was 
another kind of a political system. But the, the chief or the tribal leader said, great idea, let's form a company. <laughs> and they formed BP Oil. That's the history of that relationship. So to me, I've, and this is everywhere in Indonesia as well, is, is the value sharing between, it's, it's kind of a north-south issue um, of, the, of the ocean resources. And no one knows how to do it. Maybe to add to that, so uh, for this particular project, James, which your question was about, I was also intimately involved over the summer. Um, and what we're doing there as a sort of a follow-up, and this is true for some of the other projects as well, uh, we've seen that there was a lot of awareness raised about the fact that, for example, we don't have sufficient imagery, satellite imagery over the oceans. So we've now partnered with some of the providers there that will start uh, tasking their satellites to capture uh, images over the oceans. Uh, we are uh, um, creating a foundation called Ocean AI that will start actually at the end of this month um, to start continuing some of the work that was done this summer. Uh, we're fundraising for that to see how we can sort of continue the, uh, to build on the work the fellows have done this summer. And we're, uh, you know, for some of the other projects, we're, we're really trying to figure out how do we go all the way through the, let's say, the chain that Prudencio uh, described from, you know, a model or an idea data to model all the way through adoption. Um, and as you go out later after this panel session ends, we'll have the fellows uh, outside who, with their posters, and you can talk to them about how uh, we've planned and talked with their partners on continuing some of the work beyond the summer to ensure adoption. Uh, next question. Yeah, in the middle there, it might be hard to reach with the microphone, but Sorry. give it a shot. Well, hello everyone. My name is Jan. I'm a Nova student myself, uh, but I'm from nerd school, not business school. So I'm in information management. Um, Joana, about the flu prediction. Um, it's a super important topic um, with like a major impact on like global health. And like fortunately, I got to look into it like well some time ago. And I just wanted to address the fact that, well, Google in the past um, had to or tried to raise this initiative called Google Flu Trends, where they, well, tackled the same issue with a very similar method, like correlating search queries with the outbreak of the flu disease. And to the best of my knowledge, um, they did not succeed. Like, in the long run, the, the predictions were quite bad, so they stopped the program and so far, there has been no further research on this, on this issue. So I was just wondering how your model, that seemed quite successful, um, well, can outperform the previous research, or what makes it that significantly better to what has been done before? <clears throat> hey, th those are actually my last three slides that I didn't show. <laughs> so it's Lee's fault that you didn't get there. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, you're absolutely right. So one of the things that Google tried to do that I didn't try to do was to predict the peak. What we're trying to do is to predict the onset. And uh, this is exactly because we think that where Google failed is because it's very sensitive to media hype. So people, if you talk about flu on the media, people go and search for the flu regardless of having symptoms. So you, you start seeing the curves going up and it's very sensitive to um, uh, non-symptomatic searches. So what we're doing is that we're looking at the onset, so before you, usually before the media hype starts. And uh, the other thing that we've done now, which is also part of our anxiety work, is that we've been able to identify search terms that people use when they actually have the symptoms and search terms that people use when they are just afraid. So we, we, some of them are just fear-related, and you go online and you search because you're afraid, and some you search because you're, you actually are sick. And we can totally correlate the different search terms based on the number of cases versus the number of news on the New York Times, for instance. So some of them correlate with the news, and some of them correlate with actual number of cases. So we can refine the system, and when you talk about data and the, the amount of data that exists, and it's true that there's so much data to know your data, to know exactly how to work with it, to know the problems and all of the fellows here and the, the, I'm really impressed with the work that you've done in 12 weeks because one of the trickiest parts is to know your data to solve a real problem because lo lots of it is useless and unless you really think about it and you uh, do the step to understand what is the problem that you're trying to solve you're just having algorithms and you're just doing machine learning and feeding blindly whatever it is into your black box and then hoping that whatever comes 
on the other side is useful. And sometimes it is, but mostly it's not. So I, I think one of the things that they were doing is that they were really not understanding the type of data they were using. One problem. Second problem is that the problem that they were trying to predict, which is peak, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. The, our idea is that if you can identify the onset, usually the peak comes two months afterwards, so you already give a lot of ahead time for politicians and for the ones who, or, or for health practitioners to prepare. So that, that's the idea here. Thank you. Great. Next question. Hello. Uh, my name is Fernando Buitrago, and I belong to the Institute of Astrophysics and Space Science and the University of Lisbon. Well, first of all, uh, let me congratulate all of you for this wonderful meeting. And my question is also to Joanna Sa. And it's about that you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that uh, your background was a physicist, as a particle uh, physicist. So my question is, uh, people like me, which uh, I work on pure science, let's say, without any of these applications, we have also developed wonderful algorithms, wonderful uh, neural networks in order to do something completely different that, let's say, what the society needs. In your case, you move from something uh, also from pure science to something which has an application to society. How could you realize that the problem that you are working with could have an impact or could have some implication? So how did your movement from pure science to something which, it's, uh, which has more applications to real life society? Uh. <laughs> I, I I always uh, get the <laughs> pure science question, <laughs> and I'll explain what I mean by this. So there's one thing that unites all physicists, which is the arrogance that uh, <laughs> they work on pure science. <laughs> and then, so it's true that it's it's very. And I, I actually worked more on applied math when I was a physicist. So it was really more. Um, well, uh, there was no society there. But in terms of science, and we were talking about the Renaissance before, and I really think that we've been trying to compartmentalize things too much. Okay? Science is science, and understanding is understanding, and knowledge is knowledge. And if you, you call it physics, and you call it math, and you call it data science, but we're all trying to figure out, as scientists, we're all trying to figure out problems, and we use whatever tools we have in our power, I think, to solve them. And uh, the, 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 the problem is just come and go, and it's our minds and it's our work uh, solving them. So I, I do not see myself as someone who went from physics to biology and now to social sciences. It, it's really, we have problems that are on our hands and we try to get the tools to, to solve them. It is true that in most recent years, I, and I think this is similar to what Greg was saying, there was a moment in my life where I realized that I didn't want to spend that much life, time in the lab and uh, publishing science papers or nature papers, and I really wanted to think about ways that my skills could be turned into something with a social impact. So in that sense, yes. But then the question, that's, uh, in, in, from my perspective, that's the easiest part in the sense that it, what's hard for me is to um, stick to one, <laughs> because there are so many issues and there are so many problems that you need to solve for in all different, on all different subjects that how do you go from one to the other and how do you focus and let's at least finish this one before moving on to the next one. For me, that's the hard part. So everyone who has the skills and has the, um, the knowledge and wants to do it and has the will, you've seen how much they have done in 12 weeks, right? So if you do have the skills and if you can do it, and if you want to do it, I think you, you can just go ahead and do it. And there are so many things to, to work on, from communication to oceans to um, flu to uh, tourism, and that if we all get together and do our little tiny parts, uh, we'll get there. So I, I won't worry so much about the problem and just think about what is it that you care about and that you care about now and that you can see yourself working for a few weeks on, and then you, you go from there. Because new problems are going to show up, and you're going to start having questions. Don't, don't necessarily think about, oh, what is the huge problem that I have to solve? Just grab something and do it. Sorry. We, we, yeah, 
So we have uh, the fellows come from many different disciplines. We have uh, neuroscience, uh, economists, uh, statisticians, uh, physicists, uh, computer science, and the whole range of sort of possible fields that they can come from. So maybe I also want to extend the question to uh, Mengxin or, or Tiago. What made you move from business to data science, for example? So we'll go first. So I'm not from business. I'm from economics. And it, <laughs> it, <laughs> it's not that it's more, it's not that it's, uh, more times right, but it helps me live a bit, a bit uh, happier life. Um, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I don't want to offend anyone. Um, so, <laughs> so um, I just think there, there are a lot of interesting things happening right now at Nova, in Portugal, in, in everywhere for people that are my age. Like we're, every time, it's happening more and more that we're getting clustering into our, the age that we, are, that we have. So we are like uh, millennials and we are seeking um, to have an impact, to have like some reason to wake up we don't care that much about wage, apparently, uh, but we really want to have an impact, and and that's happening. So we see with my friends, people that are, even though they're studying economics, they're they have internships at Amazon, at technology, at technology companies. So I think what's happening is that people are looking at uh, things that can be have real consequences, that um, that that things that are uh, not much derived from opinions, but from data, they are quantitative, um, and that. And that there's a lot of support around you. You have Gulbenkian next to Nova. You have amazing professors at Nova. You have incredible communities near you. So I think it's the fact that a lot of things is changing. Labor is changing. Economics, the science of scarcity, it might probably see an end in a few dozens of years. Um, so in a lot of from labor to energy. So I think a lot of things are happening. And, and it, this is just the thing we should be doing, uh, both us and the people that are enjoying the pitch right now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm also from economics. Uh, so um, basically, I think because um, I'm a PhD student, and I'm thinking that traditional economics is transiting from the uh, just doing the regression, telling the story. We are uh, trans transiting to have more impact on the social part. And uh, there's one big problem that induces this transit is that there's a lot of famous economics, or maybe not famous, just um, professors in my universities in, in your, your United States, and they have a lot of interesting ideas of economic stories of the social part, but they lack the tech knowledge uh, of and having the data for the, for the economic part, for the economic research. And sometimes they have the open source data, but the data is very large, you know, in traditional uh, economic field, and the observations for our study is just like 10,000 observations. But now the open data may like uh, over one gigabyte, over 100 gigabyte. Then they lack the tech knowledge to deal with this data. And also um, nowadays, there's a lot of different kind of unstructured data, like image data, like uh, text file data. So all these materials, all this resource can be transferred uh, into useful economic data for economic research. But uh, if, we lack, if we economics lack, lack this technology to trans transform this data, to use this data, then we, can, we will lose a lot of, uh, fam uh, a lot of in, uh, huge impact uh, economic research. Uh, so that's why a lot of uh, economists want to have some data science technology, want to have some, uh, want to have, uh, have co-authors in different, in, maybe in statistics, maybe in computer science field. Uh, yeah, and that's why I'm double major in statistic. <laughs> uh, so just keeping an eye on time, yeah, go ahead. Do you have a microphone nearby? Or we... Oh, here it is, yeah. No, you, you just, you, this conversation, I just want to make a related comment on, on it all, and that is that, um, you know, when, when we developed the Ocean Health Index, we weren't the first index for the ocean. We were some, there were a number of failures, and I always try to mentor my staff that you have to fail. There were 21 e-books before Kindle got it right. There was a bunch of rideshare programs before Uber got it right, et cetera. 
And, um, and, and also, I kind of just want to emphasize a little bit of the unexpected that will come out of your explorations in your minds. And I'll share something that I just, that just happened to me a couple weeks ago. Gordon Moore, everybody know who Gordon Moore is? He founded Intel. He invented the, arguably the computer chip, the, silica, the, the, the computer chip that we all use for all of this. He's a, he's a friend of mine. I've known him for a long time. He's quite old now. He's almost 90, but his brain is still sharp as a tack. And I was out seeing him. I brought a drone to his house. He lives in Hawaii. And he thought that was pretty cool. We were flying around his house. And then I picked the drone up and I said, Gordon, when you invented the computer chip, I think it was 59 or 1960, he was a chemical engineer, by the way, did you ever have any idea this would happen? And then I kind of broadly pointed to the world and everything else. And he said, Greg, to tell you the truth, we thought we'd be lucky if the chip made a refrigerator run better. (laughs) And I said, well, you you achieved that, Gordon, definitely. But th- that was very, a very poignant little anecdote for me, and I just want to share it with you all as well. The thing that transformed and brought us all here was a, kind of an accident. <laughs> all right, so why don't we take, uh, given that we're the only thing between you and lunch, uh, one more yeah, one more question, and then uh, do you have the microphone already, Pedro? Okay, and then we'll go to lunch. No, you don't go to lunch let me do some work. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and I'll just address a, a question to Jane. Uh, I, I, I was really happy to see here the power of data science to, to improve society. But I think at the same time it also raises a number of, of issues in education, in ethics, in leadership, in government. Uh, and, and I'd like to see you comment a little bit on that. Because you know we uh, hear terms like machine learning, uh, like uh, huge bunches of data about people, uh, and we see on a daily basis news about how Google and Amazon and stuff like that do. Companies like that use those data to make money out of us. Uh, and, and I think this raises questions of ethics, of leadership in society, uh, definitely implications for education uh, that need to be addressed before society as a whole is more comfortable embarking on this journey. Uh, I, in, in, I, I'm sure you've thought quite a bit about that. I, I'd really like to, to hear your, your thoughts on these. So Pedro thought of an easy question for you, Jane. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think about this pretty much all day, every day, so it's a good, good question. Definitely don't have the answer, but uh, I would say what Joanna was saying um, about science is science, knowledge is knowledge, uh, and I hope to see that uh, sooner rather than later there's a little bit more dissemination of the knowledge of uh, data, the tools and methods you use to analyze and interpret it, computers. (laughs) It's kind of all these things that seem very mystifying, I think, to the average person, and I hope to see that um, sort of power of knowledge decentralized a little bit. Uh, And I think that also, as there's more and more data being collected uh, on you without maybe your knowledge or uh, you just accept whatever terms and agreements you need to get your Netflix account or whatever it is, uh, that there's also more autonomy and awareness among people of uh, what data is being collected about them and some power to uh, at least control what happens to it in the future because I think that's a really uh, pressing question. Is that, anyone else have something to add? Can I? Sorry. So one thing that, I, that I, I worry about that a lot, especially using personal data or medical data, and one, one thing that I, I think I realize is that there is no neutrality. So the decisions are not neutral, ever. The order in which you put your food in the cafeteria is not neutral. The fact that you put dessert first or soup before affects how people are going to decide whether they're going to have dessert or not. So there's no neutrality. There's no neutrality on any of the medical decisions that the ministry uh, makes. Either they are conscious or not, that's a different thing. But the, the only thing that we can, in principle, try to do is to provide the information and to make these decisions a little bit more conscious so that they know that their decision has an impact on one way or the other. But I, um, and all of these nudges and interfering with people, people's lives, 
by using information on their behavior that can be used for the dark side or the I, it seem, it's I, I think it's fundamental but but uh, the moment we realize that there is no neutral position that all, all of the decisions that we make are going to have an impact the only thing that we're trying to do is to shine some light on how these decisions are being made and why so again it's this idea that we're going to have more information and more information uh, um, being offered to the people so that they know that they're being interfered with in their daily lives um, but the the idea that if we don't use it, it's neutral, I don't think it's true, because it's, not, it's, not, it's never neutral. So I think with those words, uh, I'd like to uh, invite you to a last round of applause for the panelists. Thank you very much. So can, I, can I have the microphone? microphone? Oh. OK. And to continue these rounds of applause, the fellows and students, DSSG 2017. What a fantastic work, guys. They didn't know each other. It was the first time that they met on June 1st, 2017. They exchanged a few words. And what a wonderful crowd this was. I'm so proud and so amazed with what they did in such a short period of time. But this does not go without a tremendous help by so many people here that you see. These are the staff, the academic network, the remote support, people who contributed a lot. Can you raise your hands, please, just to see the staff and the guys, other, other guys? And a round of applause for them. Fantastic group of people. Thank you so much. To the sponsors, to the, pro to the people who helped us with technology, with funds, uh, with, with many things that we could only dream of. Uh, we did not talk about Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure with their uh, in-kind uh, donation in cloud services and, uh, and uh, computing resources. And then our partners, what a fantastic dedicated group of people these, these were. Can I just ha see a hands of the partners? Laura Morelli, Jose Mel Saude, uh, Rada Municipality, EFP. What a group of people. Um, we're so lucky to have you with us. This is just a short list of people that we had the chance to interact with. I, I don't know, I'm missing so many. I know I'm missing so many. I apologize. This was a massive project. This, is a, this was a, the work that I didn't even know that is going to take so much time. It did even more. We stressed tested Nova School of Business and Economics. Yes, you are still right. This is a business school huh, that does this. This is the business school of the 21st century, Nova School of Business and Economics. And I would like to, to thank especially the Nova School of Business and Economics communication team. I missed to do that last time when we had the uh, kickoff event. Uh, can I see the communication team, please, the hands? Can we give them a round of applause here? There is, there is one more reason why I ask uh, special thanks to, besides an amazing help that they did, Ana Hilario is here for the press that is here. We saw you taking notes and stuff. You may want to coordinate uh, your inquiries through her. Ana, thank you for helping with that. And you know, <laughs> talking about the pressure, Mr. Pedro Santa Clara. Can I please ask you to stand up? Pedro Santa Clara. And I think we can continue a little bit more, please. You know, Nova is building this campus in, uh, in Kashkais, And uh, there are some busy people. I guess Pedro Santa Clara is one of them. And you know, when you start and you know nobody at, at the school and you used to go there and you want to organize something in the SSG, coordinate so many people around the world, you start asking, so who do I, who do I go with? I went once to the meeting with Pedro Santa Clara and I ignored him. And he comes to me and he says, look, you probably don't understand. I'm your man. <laughs> and from day, that day forward, uh, he was an incredible help, inspiration. He was answering the call always, every email. He was proactive, helping. And I cannot thank you enough, Pedro, in doing this. Thank you very much. And uh, to kind of finish with a good story, we made data science for social good Europe. And we are starting the global network. We want all of you to join in the way that you can. Give us data. 
Give us ideas. Give us your skills, talents. Join our network. Next year, we are planning multiple events. Besides Chicago, Lisbon, we had here uh, people from University of North Carolina in Charlotte to get trained to run the DSSG there. Gizan, can you please stand up? And, and she did such a marvelous work that we decided to give her more work. <laughs> she, she did not become a trainee. She, become, she became part of the staff. We enjoyed so much her presence. And... Um, we want you to also know that at Nova School of Business and Economics, we are starting, uh, we have already started the data lab. We want to, we are betting on data. We want to have data there. We want to also open data to different researchers. If you know for good data sources and how to build these relationships, please come to us. There are people from the data lab at Nova and we are ready to help you. And uh, you know what? I think it's enough. <laughs> Thank you all for being with us. Join us for the lunch and uh, for the fellows. May I just kindly ask the fellows to come here? We didn't see you guys, kind of. I don't know you. Just uh, for the photo and... Uh... Come. No, no, no. Come here. Come here, Julian. We have the youngest fellow here. You may not believe, but Julian came to the first day. How old are you, Julian? Thirteen. Thirteen. And you know, to have fun, he took out Tableau and started uh, running some uh, data crunching. What a young man. I you know the, the youth cannot be stopped. And guys, can you come here as well a little bit here? Push here. And can you ask the staff, Chiwei, Laura. Chiwei, Laura, come here. Joao, Gizem, please come here with us. Paul, you can stand here as well on the light. Euro. Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Bello? Oh, look at him. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know, am I missing somebody? Somebody hiding? They usually do, you know. I am going to take this word uh, on behalf of DSSG Europe 2017. I thank you all and uh, see you 2018. Thank you. And can I ask the partners now to come in? Partners, come in. Partners, come in. We want to take some photos. Thank you very much, all. Yeah, you can, you can go there and start eating. You can go. Don't worry. We are taking photos and all the, all the stuff. Taking some photos. Thank you so much.